we're going to talk about Civilization 7 today. I was given an incredible opportunity by 2K Games and Firaxis to fly out to Baltimore and check out Firaxis Studios and play Civilization 7. And so today, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the game, we'll talk about their ideas behind the changes they have made, and get an idea what Civilization 7 is, is all about. Uh, a little background, I am a massive Civilization fan. Uh, I rank Civ 2 as one of my favorite games ever. Uh, I've been playing since, since Civilization 1. Um, I have many hours of Civilization on my channel. Uh, and so, uh, needless to say, I was very excited to go out and play Civilization. Even just, just to see Sid Meier's chair was, was, worth, was worth the flight. <laughs> Um, with 2K provided. Thank you, 2K. Uh, so me and, and several other YouTube folks were sent out a couple weeks ago to check this out, get a presentation on their ideas behind the game, and play it for three hours. So I'll break this down into parts, and we'll talk about some of the things about the game, and uh, some of their ideas, and, and where we I think it'll go. So uh, first off, they gave us a presentation talking about what their ideas are, and, and why they've changed some things. Because there are certainly some things that are quite a bit different in this one than any other civs in the past. This is a um, 5 and 6 civilization. We're pretty close together. Same idea. 7 is, is a leap in, in a different direction. Uh, is it a good direction? We'll see. Number one, on the presentation, they talked about how cities uh, evolve over time. And how whenever they do evolve, they give London as an example, uh, it changes drastically. So you've got the old Roman settlement, and then it became... Uh, a medieval city, this is London, and when it became a medieval city, there's not really any remnants of that Roman settlement left. That evolving idea, that changing through the ages idea is very prevalent here in their, it's the big theme here for Civ 7. The other thing that they talked about, which, which kind of hit home, is I've been playing Civ, you know, every iteration for hundreds and hundreds of hours. And one thing that's kind of common, I think among most Civilization players, is you start the game, and you get a good game going. It gets around Renaissance era or so, and you're like, ah, I'll go to bed, I'm done. You get up the next day. Do you continue that game from Renaissance on and finish the win, or do you start a new game? Yeah, you start a new game. It's Because the, the best part of the game is, is that early game, that exploration, the building the sieve. That's the best part of the game. And so that was a, uh, a theme that they, ha they have been addressing in this one. And... And the other thing is, even if you decide to, uh, if you do decide to stick with your game, the late game kind of either becomes a slog or becomes like you know you're gonna win. You're just clicking your way through until you get to the end of the game. And so that is that was addressed. And those are the two main themes for Civ Seven. And after my three hours of play, I'll start from the beginning. One of the big changes is you no longer choose your civilization. And stick with it. You choose your leader and you choose your civilization. I chose Amina of Zizao as my leader. Each leader has their own traits, their own perks, and you're stuck with that leader for the whole game. You also choose your civilization. The civilizations are era dependent. I chose Rome. And so, this is big. Amina, who I, my leader, is going to be there forever. You can one thing about that is you can have like Ben Franklin. So you're going to have other leaders in there besides like state leaders. You're going to have other folks thrown in there, but your leader is there forever. Your sieve is going to change. You have that sieve for just that era, and they've tried to uh, to add variety with that. So you've got, of course, you got your tech tree and you got your civic tree. Uh, each civilization has their own specific tree. So as Rome. I was building legions and villas and basilica, and I had a centurion, which is my leader, which we'll get to in a minute. There's leaders now. There's also a leader attributes thing. So your leader is, is developing, your civilization is developing, and even when you move to a new era and you're no longer Rome, we'll talk about it in a minute, you still have those Roman civics stay with you. We'll talk about more of that in a second. The next big change, which I think is the biggest change, that's not, that one wasn't the biggest change, this is the biggest change, is there's now three eras. And so you have the Antiquity Age. And this is all I was able to play. All they were allowed us to play was three hours of the Antiquity Age. We weren't allowed to change and, and evolve into the next age. After the three hours, I got about to the end of that. And on standard speed. There's the Antiquity, antiquity Age, this is all about settling 
building your ancient uh, empire and, and your foundations, you know? There's no ocean exploration. You just have trireme, so you can go uh, not very far. And then you go into the exploration era. And the way the ages change is a, a big uh, a big thing. There's a, um, we'll talk about this in a minute, but there's, like, there's this whole crisis event, and everyone shifts at one time. And at the end of that age, when you switch over to the exploration age, you're going to keep your leader, but you will choose a new civilization. And the civilization you choose depends on how you played in the ancient era, antiquity age. So uh, the, 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 the example they gave us was you start out as Egypt, and this will change, but you can go and you can shift over to Songhai, or maybe you built an empire with horses, and you had a lot of horse combat-focused uh, uh, civ-specific uh, um, attributes that you, you put into horses. Then Mongols will be an option for you to choose, and you can choose the Mongol tree. And I think all the, the doing all this and the change for all this is because each era is going to be based on these uh, these legacy paths and how you win the game. You don't a lot of times on Civ, especially in the later Civs five and six, you kind of build your start and you know what you're going to do. I'm going for a science victory in your first hundred turns or so. You know if you're going to win or not. They're breaking this up into these three different ages because you may you may go science in the antiquity era but then you can see all the other your opponents are also going science and so it might behoove you to switch over to military or culture for the next age because it'll be a little bit easier on you I, I, again I, I was able to play the antiquity age I was not able to see the transition from antiquity to the exploration era um, which I really want to see. Um, anyway, after that, after that antiquity age, then it shifts over to the exploration era. You keep your leader. You choose your new civ. This is all about medieval to the colonization era. Uh, um, the world grows, and you and you get to go out and explore islands and colonize. And they're trying to go for that, rather than playing the ancient age and then give up and start over again. Now you have, it's the same game, but it's new. Lots of new things have opened up for you in that era. And then again, ideally, with the modern era, which is the last one. So, and each of these are broken up with a crisis at the end, which we'll talk about later on, which sort of separates these distinct eras. Uh, another change, which is smaller than those two, is diplomacy. Diplomacy, there is a there is a currency called influence, which you can use to for diplomatic actions. Um, even whenever you greet somebody... You can use this influence to sway the greeting as like a friendly greeting or a more hostile greeting. Your trade uh, is is factored into that. Um, where you whether you want to um, uh, uh, trade options or if you want to support wars, that's also factored into that influence as a as a currency that you can use to spend on that. Uh, there are no more minor civs. They are now called independent nations, independent peoples. Uh, you can use those influence to befriend them uh, uh, or to. Uh, um, ally with them later on. You can even buy units using that influence from those minor nations or independent nations in, and add them into your army. Um, a big change. Change number three. Uh, we now have leaders. And uh, one thing that one thing about the later civs, which I think has made the game easier in my opinion, is you have this hex map and you swarm it with units. You you're going to be much smarter at moving those units across those hexes when you have swarms of them than the AI, than any AI will be. And so I think this might change some difficulty because your your leaders will pack up four to six units, depending on their their um, skill, and then move across the map. And so you're not having stacks of doom, like the old sieves, but you also aren't spreading across the map and, and swaying battles just by doing that, by, by covering the land. Um, each of these leaders have um, have commendation points, and so you can get bigger armies, you can move faster. Um, when, I, when I was playing my leader, I was giving them the ability to add um, attack damage and things. Uh, they were my Any units that were in those in that leader's uh, uh, group um, which takes up one hex, that one leader is one hex, was was cheaper. I didn't have to pay so much for them because they were in with the leader. 
Uh, another leader I had had this, anyone adjacent to him got an attack bonus. And um, you can also, there's a, an action you can do as your leader. You can command all of your melee guys to attack at once. They get a plus one attack. All your ranged guys attack at once, plus one ranged attack. Um, so leaders are kind of a neat, kind of a neat addition um, to throw it in there. And also they help. I had like a siege weapon that I was trying to move across the map. It was moving one hex a turn. I got a leader over there. It was moving three hexes a turn. So it was nice to kind of move units around a little faster. We'll go into winning the game. So you've got these legacy paths, they call it. Science, culture, military, economic. And depending on how you do, you get all the text, you, you advance in the scientific legacy path. Every time you advance in this, it ticks up the end of the age timer. And when that timer gets near the end, you build a wonder. You, you, um, you defeat, a, you defeat a, a nation. Um, you, I, I did military one. I conquered, I owned like five cities and I conquered, I think seven or four more cities that got me to the peak of the military era, gave me a golden age and advanced the end of era timer for everyone. When you hit very near the end of the era timer, you advance into the crisis. When the crisis happens, it happens at the end of the ancient era and the exploration era. And of course, at the end of the modern era, that's winning the game then something happens something terrible happens uh, in, in my game I don't know I don't know if this is this is all antiquity era it's always this or if it's something different but in mine and, and other folks is um, barbarian camp spawned so we're the last the last 25 50 somewhere in their turns of the era barbarian camp spawned everywhere and then 10 more turns a bunch of units started spawning out. Barbarians started spawning out. And so you're kind of in this final era, uh, this end of this era, you're you're fighting against this crisis event. In addition to that, you also have negative traits popping in that are kind of tearing you down in, in some way. You get to choose between four options what terrible thing you want to happen, whether you want units to cost more or food, bad food, um, uh, or less food, or you get less income coming in. Something bad is happening to your empire. And every 10 turns or so, another one of those comes in. And so you just have these swarms and swarms of barbarians coming out at the end of the ancient era. I'm assuming they're going for kind of like the Sea People's Bronze Age collapse kind of thing with that. Um, kind of a neat idea and, and um, the sort of conclusion of an age. It really sets that – it bookends that age, which I think is what they're going for. Um, and then whenever you complete that, finish that crisis, complete the era, then you go into Exploration Age, which I didn't get to see. This is not a review, but I'll tell you what I what I think about some things. A few other things also that popped up. Um, um, goody huts. Now you get like a choice on your goody huts. Uh, you can now navigate down some rivers, which is very nice. Um, I was able to have a city on a lake, and then it was a coastal town because there was a river that connected to the ocean. I appreciate that. I'm not sure about changing nations every era. Um... That's something that uh, younger me would not appreciate, but I get what they're going for. And this has become a much more like a leader-focused thing. Um, it is cool that all, like in my game that I played, all the Roman stuff is still there. And even when you advance, the Roman stuff is still there. It was, a, I was, even though I was, I was um, uh, Amina uh, from Nigeria, it was a very Roman city. You know, I had the Colosseums and all that stuff in there. Um or villas, and it was a very Roman-themed city. And so it'll be interesting to see that change over to a new one and how that works. Uh, I think the uh, the era change is the thing I want to see the most. And I think that's, 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 that's the big thing. Um, how is that going to play out? And is that going to solve what they're trying to solve here and the, and the keep, you, you, want you, you want to keep playing when you advance to the new age? And it also keeps the win conditions, whether you're going to win or not, up in the air between each each era. And really, after um, after the three hours of me getting getting to play, and I played up to the end of those three hours, um, really, I just wanted to play one more turn. I think that's that's about um, that's about all all you want out of a Civ game. 
So those are my thoughts. Um, if you want to see more of like a more kind of behind the scenes, kind of a vacation vlog kind of a thing, I got a separate channel. I'll put that over there. I'll put a link around here somewhere. And you can click on that and check that out. But those are my thoughts on Civ 7. I, uh, as soon as I get an opportunity to play it again and show it off, I will definitely be doing that. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.